Today on the BRS 160, we're gonna cycle this tank. Hey guys, my name is Ryan. Welcome to another week of the BRS 160, where every week we do our best to help you guys, members of the reefing community, enjoy your tanks and find new ways to explore the hobby. We do that by the setup and progression of this 160 gallon reef tank. This week we're gonna talk about biological filtration and the nitrogen cycle. This starts with a real understanding of what ammonia is, where it comes from, and why it's toxic. We'll explore the methods of using bacteria to convert this highly toxic ammonia into safer nitrite and nitrate, as well as a final stage of nitrogen gas where it can leave the tank for good. We'll also share all of the most common ways to get bacteria to populate a new tank and start the nitrogen cycle to make it safe for your fish, as well as some different testing methods and share how we're going to cycle the BRS-160. Ammonia is a result of fish and other organisms in the tank consuming large volumes of nitrogen that they really don't need for biological functions, so they get rid of it in the form of ammonia. Most organisms in the tank are going to excrete ammonia into the water, but the largest source is what's released by the fish's gills. The gills act as a membrane which allow the high levels of free ammonia within the gills to pass through into the tank water, which has very little ammonia. For the fish to free themselves of the ammonia, the surrounding water has to contain very low levels of ammonia to begin with. If the tank has high levels, it makes it difficult for the fish to pass the ammonia through their gills. In fact, at high enough levels, the opposite might start to happen, where the ammonia transfers from the tank water into the fish through their gills. At this point, bad things are about to happen in the tank. Outside of biological processes and fish food, ammonia can also enter the tank through tap water treated with chloramines, which is chlorine mixed with ammonia. Many salt mixes and additives have small amounts of ammonia left over from the refinement process. This is particularly true if you're attempting to use low-grade do-it-yourself additives. Ammonia comes in two forms, NH3, which is free ammonia and the most toxic, as well as NH4, which is ammonium. Ammonium has less of a negative impact, but both are a concern with marine fish. NH3 and NH4 are in a constant state of changing between each other millions or even billions of times every second. How much of the ammonia in the tank that exists as NH3 free ammonia is dependent on the pH of the tank. Luckily at pH is common in reef aquariums, most of the ammonia in the tank exists as NH4 ammonium, which is less dangerous. The thing about ammonia is we all know it's likely the most common toxic substance in the tank, and there's a constant source of this toxic substance being added to the tank every day. Even knowing that, very few reefers monitor or consider this as a possible cause when they're having trouble with the tank, even when the corals and fish are dying. More or less, most of us just close our eyes and assume the bacteria are always doing their job and can handle whatever happens in the tank, which probably isn't the best assumption we could make. In reality, the chain effect ammonia can have in the tank is likely one of the leading causes of tank crashes. Any organism dying in the tank or a large accidental addition of food can easily cause an ammonia spike which can stress and kill other tank inhabitants. This can unravel fast with some pretty devastating consequences because each death adds more ammonia and compounds the problem. Even smaller unnoticeable spikes can easily stress the fish and make them more susceptible to illness. When something goes wrong, most of us are more likely to consider how reef safe some random piece of plastic we put in the tank is. Are we using the right salt or did I use the right silicone for the tank? Or mysterious things like old tank syndrome is a cause, but very rarely does anyone consider the health of their biological filtration, which they rely on solely to constantly remove a toxic substance from the tank. That doesn't mean that an ammonia spike is a cause of all tank crashes out there or illness outbreaks, but it absolutely belongs in the conversation when you have an issue like like this. One thing to keep in mind is your tank's biological filtration is completely dependent on the size of the bacterial population, and that size of population is completely dependent on the amount of food being ammonia that's consistently added to the tank. So if you start adding significantly more ammonia, it might take a bit for the bacterial population to expand to compensate. So any rapid increase or addition of ammonia will likely overwhelm the current population of bacteria and cause an ammonia spike in the tank. Some common causes could be a significant increase of fish or foods in the tank. Many macroalgae consume ammonia directly, so removing a huge swath of algae from your fuge could possibly increase ammonia. Obviously something large dying in the tank could cause this. A contaminant or environmental issue could impact the bacteria population as well. So all that said, I have to admit, I'm one of the reefers who historically never really considered ammonia much, and certainly very rarely tested for it. I think I can give a few pretty solid reasons for that. Starting with test kits are a pain to do. Most ammonia kits are often hard to read, not accurate down to a useful level, and you have to have a non-expired one around at the time you're concerned about the tank, which is fairly rare. 
All of this leads to very few people really producing accurate ammonia readings correlated to any tank events and likely why it isn't part of a larger conversation. There's a somewhat recent exception to that rule with the Sennai monitor, which does a variety of things, but one of them is very unique with monitoring free ammonia and displaying it on your computer or sending you level alerts via email. I have a lot of alerts set up on my Apex Aquarium controller to tell me if something is going wrong with the tank, like pH, temperature, water levels, ORP, leaks, all kinds of stuff which I find super valuable, but all that is very different than telling me my ammonia is rising, which is basically telling me my fish are dying or at serious risk and something should be done quick to save the tank. I think as the Senai becomes more widely used and reefers have usable, trackable ammonia data, we might see the conversation about ammonia in the reef tank change a bit. Okay, so now that we have a good handle on the dangers of ammonia, I'm going to say in most cases it's super easy to set up a biological filtration system which is capable of rapidly expanding and contracting its population and quickly converting ammonia into much safer elements. This biological filtration is based completely around maintaining a healthy population of beneficial bacteria. It's this bacteria which is going to safely process the ammonia in the tank. Really all we need to do is provide proper habitat for the beneficial bacteria to thrive, which is a warm, well oxygenated area with lots of surface area. This is most commonly achieved with sand and live rock in the tank, sometimes supplemented with rock or other filtration media like this marine pier in the sump. The bacteria that live on these surfaces produce energy for their biological functions by oxidizing the ammonia into a much safer form of nitrogen for the reef tank being nitrite. Bacteria then convert the nitrite into nitrate, which is even safer and at low to average levels not really considered toxic at all. However, over time the nitrate will accumulate in the tank and will either serve as a nutrient that feeds algae growth or at higher levels will irritate fish and corals. Removing nitrate and other undesirable nutrients is a primary reason why most reefers do water changes. So where does all this bacteria come from and how do we get the cycle started in the tank? The bacteria comes from basically anywhere and there really isn't much you could do to prevent it from populating the tank. That's why so many reefers are comfortable using dry dead rock to start with and just letting the bacteria populate on its own over the course of a few to several weeks depending on the type of rock you use. If you'd like it to happen faster, there are a plethora of ways to do that. First one is by starting with wet live rock, which presumably is covered in bacteria, and the starting population is able to multiply itself much faster. There's also a ton of bacteria additives out there. Biospira is one the team here at BRS uses frequently with new tanks and dry rock. Red Sea has a cool kit with bacteria, some bacteria food, and some other additives to get a tank off to a good start. Two Little Fishes, Brightwell, and KZ also have some bacteria options for cycling in a tank. To start growing the population of bacteria in the tank, you need a source of ammonia. Reefers at one point used to just throw in a hardy fish like a damsel, feed it, and let the process start on its own, primarily with the ammonia released from the damsel's gills. Most people now consider that process to be pretty cruel and don't do that any longer. You can also cycle a tank with what many people refer to as phantom feeding, which is just adding a small amount of food to a tank with no fish every day and let it decay to create ammonia. This is obviously much more humane, but it will take substantially longer. With the bacterial additives out there, there's two primary approaches to this. With a product like Biospira, the main approach is to dose the tank with a large volume of bacteria and add a fish in its gills as a source of ammonia to feed the bacteria. I've seen a ton of success with this method, and I've personally never seen a negative effect to the fish or ammonia spikes that I can see with a typical test kit, but both are really not the ideal way of monitoring this. There's been a new wave of products which combine the approach of bacterial additives with the more sophisticated form of phantom feeding and doesn't require a live fish. The Red Sea Reef Mature Pro contains a bottle of bacteria as well as a bottle which essentially serves as bacteria food and you add the food over a period of time to feed the bacteria to make the tank safe for fish. Brightwell also has a version of this with the Fast Start M and the Micro Bacter 7. Overall, this bacterial additive combined with the refined phantom feeding is probably one of the better ways to cycle a tank and make it safe for your first fish. Big question everyone has is how long does it take to build up the bacterial population and make it safe for that first fish as well as the ones following? There's no clear answer to that other than when there's no ammonia or nitrite in the tank, which indicates the bacteria populations have risen and are properly processing the ammonia in the tank. This means you need to test for these elements. Outside of that, you're just guessing. 
It should take a few to several weeks depending on the tank, rock, and style of cycling selected. After that, I would say a good rule of thumb is to never more than double the fish or food load in a single month. And if you're a good reefer, monitor the ammonia after livestock additions or changes in feeding. The last piece of all this is somewhat theoretical in the essence that most of us believe we can use bacteria to convert all that nitrate that accumulates from the cycle into nitrogen gas, which to some degree means the food you add to the tank can eventually be fully processed back into nitrogen gas, where it bubbles up out of the tank and released into atmosphere where it's available to other organisms but most importantly is no longer in the tank. This last step is theorized to happen in very low oxygen areas in the tank, like the bottom layer of a six inch deep sand bed, deep within the internal layers of your live rock, or within larger pieces of filtration media like marine pier, placed in low flow areas in the tank. There's a tremendous amount of anecdotal evidence supporting this theory, and in the right implementation, I personally believe it can be a component of nitrate removal from the tank. There's a lot of elements not fully understood related to this, but if the last step of the cycle was a critical component of my tank setup, I would personally either select a low density rock like Pukani, which is more likely to allow significant water penetration, or attempt to use these large marine pier bricks in a low flow area of the sump. Time to discuss how we're going to cycle the BRS 160 and get ready for fish. We decided to do the safest option for our fish, which we felt was a Red Sea Reef Mature Pro Kit. I'll be honest, this isn't the cheapest or easiest way to do this, and probably because of that, not the most popular one, but it's likely one of the best ways, particularly for newer reefers, to get a tank up and running because it also addresses some other common issues with cycling a new tank. There are four products included in the kit. The first one is Nitro Back, which is a concentrated blend of nitrifying and denitrifying spores designed to seed the bacteria population on your rock, sand, and biomedia in the tank. Bactostart, which is a blend of nitrogen and phosphorus compounds that simulate the natural waste compounds from an active aquarium, basically that phantom feeding we covered earlier. There's a bottle of NO3 PO4X which is designed to provide a special food source for that type of bacteria which is going to complete that last stage from nitrate to nitrogen gas. They add this because new tanks are particularly prone to algae outbreaks. Using a product like this keeps the nutrient levels down and combats algae outbreaks before they have a chance to take hold. This last bottle is called Cage Coralline Grow. This is a bit misleading because it doesn't contain any coralline algae or really anything specific to coralline algae. It's more or less just an alkalinity additive. However, maintaining alkalinity is probably the single most important element for a reefer who's actively trying to get additional coralline coverage in the tank. Since we're using this purple Reef Rock 2.1, coralline algae really isn't a concern to us, and we'll be maintaining calcium and alkaline with a different method later, so we probably won't use this bottle. The kit includes a series of steps which last about three weeks, at which point you should be really confident the tank is ready for fish. I do wish they offered larger kits because I'm going to need at least three of them for the BRS 160. In conjunction with that, I advise most people pick up a test kit like the Marine Care Package from Red Sea which measures ammonia, nitrite, and nitrate so you know for sure the tank is ready for fish. In our case, we're going to do something a bit different and install the Senai monitor. I've seen this thing at trade shows all over the world for years, and to be honest, I didn't fully understand the value until they sent us a sample, and the team here at BRS started to play with it and really discuss the role of ammonia in the reef tank. Installed on the BRS 160, I expect to be able to use it to closely monitor the ammonia levels during the cycle process as well as after every major addition of livestock. Beyond that, on a long-term basis, it's going to be able to tell me if there are ever any issues with my biological filtration. It does require that you change out these small tabs once a month at the cost of about 10 bucks. It's easy to shy away from that concept, but it's not all that much different than other consumable testing elements like reagent refills or pH probes. End of the day, if you ask me if I found real-time display and warning systems based around free ammonia or pH, I think I'd have trouble selecting one over the other, and this thing does both. The Senai does offer some other benefits like temperature and level monitoring. It also has some really cool lighting features which we'll explore in detail in a few weeks when we get into our lighting episodes. Next week we're going to dive into UV sterilizers. This one should be fun because there's some pretty hotly debated theories on UV sterilizers and what they do. We're going to dive right into the middle of it so hit that subscribe button. If you're interested in learning more about any of the stuff we talked about today, check out this link. Also, if you have any thoughts or experience on the Senai monitor, the team here and the BRS community in general would absolutely love to hear what you think in the comments area down below. See you next week with week 14 of the BRS 160 UV sterilizers.